The Christian Sport Castle in Osu is a major historical landmark of Accra. The castle went through many lives. It was the headquarters of the British colonial administration during the times of the Gold Coast. It then became the seat of the government of Ghana from independence up until 2013. Today, it still harbors some maritime security installations. But what most people do not know is that this imposing building also played a central role in the transatlantic slave trade. These white walls reveal dark times. The long years the castle was headquarters for the slave trade organized by the Danish crown on the west coast of Africa. With this film, we reveal this tragic story. The coast of modern-day Ghana becomes a destination for European merchants after the Portuguese built the Fort of Elmina in 1482 and start trafficking in gold and enslaved Africans. Following the Portuguese, most European nations built slave forts and trading lodges all along the coast to carry out their evil trade. In total, more than 60 European buildings are built here by the Dutch, the English, the Danes, the Swedes, and the Prussians. From the 16th to the early 19th century, more than half a million people will be forcibly displaced from the Guinea coast to plantations in the Caribbean, Brazil, and North America. To enter Osu Castle today, you must go through a narrow gate, cut through the thick fortified walls more than 350 years ago. Then you enter the inner courtyard. At first, the building seems like an architectural puzzle. The central staircase and most of the first floor were built by the British in the late 19th century, following an earthquake in 1862 that destroyed most of the upper parts of the castle. However, the structures on the ground floor with their typical Romanesque rounded arches date from the original Danish building. The first building is a small square fort built by the Danes in 1661. It occupies a site of previous Portuguese, Swedish, and Dutch trading lodges built alongside indigenous Gar fishing communities. The settlers choose the location for strategic reasons and lease the land from Mi Okaikoi, king of Gamashi. The fort dominates a small headland which allows the Danes to monitor the activities of Fort Kerfke, the only other European trading forts in the region built by the Dutch a few years earlier. The Danes call their fort Christiansborg after Christian V, the king of Denmark and Norway at the time. In 1685, the fort becomes the headquarters of the Danish administration. In the next century, it will grow into a castle four times its original size. Standing on one of the remaining flat roofs built by the Danes, you realize that trading from Africa was always a militarized affair for the Europeans. These flat roofs overlooking the surroundings were especially designed and reinforced to support troops and cannons. These fortifications have been witness to many battles. For the 200 years of the Danish presence, the castle was hotly contested. It was besieged by local communities several times, sold briefly to a Portuguese trader, 
and even taken over for a year by Nana Sameni of Akwemu, who kept the keys of the fort after returning the building to the Danes. Going back inside the building, you discover the governor's council hall. This room looking at the sea was the heart of the evil slave trade organized by the Danish governor. In this hall, generations of slave traders, both European and African, were received by the governor to negotiate deals over quantities of enslaved Africans, over banquets and long drinking sessions. Underneath the governor's council hall, the original storehouses are still standing. Here, sacks of gold and elephant tusks were once piled up to the ceiling, waiting for shipment to Copenhagen. Up until the beginning of the 1700s, the Danish merchants are mainly interested in the gold from the Guinea coast. They only engage in sporadic slave trading to the plantations of the neighboring islands of Sao Tome and Principe. Gold has become so central to the European economy that the Osu Christian Sport Castle itself adorns the Danish Ducat coins. It is estimated that one third of all of the gold exported to Europe by the Danes came through these warehouses. But the courtyard doesn't just connect to merchandise warehouses. This black door leads to a much more violent place, the castle's main slave dungeons. The Danes fully enter the transatlantic slave trade at the beginning of the 18th century when they start to produce sugar in their new colonies in the West Indies. A classic triangular trade starts. Merchandisers brought from Europe to the Guinea coast to purchase enslaved men and women. The captives are then transported to sugar plantations in the Caribbean. Finally, the raw sugar produced on the islands is brought back to Europe to be refined in the factories around Copenhagen. The Danes become major producers of sugar when they purchased the island of St. Croix from the French in 1733. As we can see on this map produced at the time, the fertile island is divided into hundreds of plots for sugar plantations. The whole colony is turned into a giant concentration camp to produce sugar. The Danish merchants use their African colony on the Guinea coast to supply enslaved labor to the island. Christiansborg Castle becomes a mass displacement center. The Christiansborg Castle has now joined a sinister list of slave forts that control the transatlantic slave trade on the Guinea coast. Captives are brought to the castle from everywhere in the subregion. Many come from the Middle Belt and northern regions of modern-day Ghana. Sometimes they are captured from places as far as present-day Côte d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Togo and Benin, or even further in northern Nigeria. All along the way, these prisoners are traded through a complex network of local merchants at numerous slave markets like Salaga, Wa, Kintampo, Ketekrachi, and Krobo. The never-ending demand for slave labor from the Danes and other European powers will profoundly transform the economic and social life of the whole region, spreading violence and conflict throughout the continent. Today, the slave dungeons have been sealed off, and with them, the memories of tens of thousands of men, women, and children who suffered, sometimes for months, in the darkness and dampness of their underground jail.
For the moment, only a narrow door out of the castle's fortifications symbolizes the final steps of the captives. Dragged out of the dungeons onto the beach and loaded as cargo onto slave ships for a journey of darkness across the Atlantic and a life of captivity. But we should never forget that if the castle was a place of oppression, it was not a place of submission. During the whole period of the transatlantic slave trade, captives constantly resisted. Like during this slave riot of the 25th of September, 1749, described in the Christiansborg Secret Council Report. Some of our Negroes and almost all the company slaves had sworn oaths to overrun the fort, murder all whites, and forcibly take all the company slaves who were in irons out of the fort. It was revealed that all our company slaves had sworn oaths to the fetish and vowed to keep faith with one another and, if necessary, die with one another. The Danish authorities discover the planned rebellion and the leaders are brutally executed. The head of a man named Otaifwe in the report is cut off and nailed to the wall opposite the slave dungeons for all to see. An act of calculated violence designed to create terror and discourage other acts of resistance. One of the countless moments of utter brutality that took place for more than a hundred years within the walls of the castle. At the end of the 18th century, 150 people live in the castle. A violent society cut off from the outside world, dominated by alcohol, conflict, intrigue, disease, and greed. New identities are emerging in that chaotic environment. Many children are born from unions between European settlers and African women, and these children occupy increasingly important positions in the slave trading society. A room next to the governor's council hall testifies to the importance of these children from mixed ancestry. This chapel used by the late president, John Atta Mills, was once what the Danes called the mulatto school. Two worlds collided here. African children were taught about the gospel and then leaning from their classroom windows, they could see other African men, women and children taken in chains across the courtyard. In 1792, Denmark becomes the first European nation to ban slave trading from the coast of Africa. Yeah. The abolition is not enforced for the next 10 years, and the last slave ship only leaves the Christiansborg shores in 1806. But 120 years of Danish slave trading have deeply transformed the whole area around the castle. Osu has become a busy trading place where powerful private merchants are connected to Europe, the Caribbean, North America, and Brazil. A cosmopolitan part of Accra that will play an important role in the future of the city. Today, the Christiansborg Castle is no longer the seat of the Ghanaian government and there are plans to turn it into a museum. With careful conservation, as well as historical and archaeological research, the Osu castle could finally release the remaining secrets of its violent past. The doors of the old slave dungeons might open once again, so that this place of horrors can finally be turned into a sacred memorial for the souls who were brutally taken away.